Okay, um, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 19 through 29. Verse 19, now Saul and they that were with, uh, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went and as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench, and the, the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the, va- for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that kills him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke unto the man, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why did you come down here, and whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and naughtiness of your heart, for you will come down that you might see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? The word of God for the people of God. Father, we thank you today, Lord God, once again for this opportunity you've given us to come before you, Lord, and to sing praise to your name, to give to you out of what you've so kindly given to us, and now to hear your word, Lord God, that transforms our minds, Lord God, and renews us. We ask you to strengthen us, Lord God, today, that we would be able to, Lord God, push past every distraction in our hearts and our minds, and that our focus and attention would be upon you. And we ask you today, Lord, to give us eyes to see, ears to hear, Lord. We ask you to enlighten the understanding of our hearts and give us the wisdom and the courage to apply your word to our lives that your name might be glorified by our living. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. So let me start by saying that some... um, manuscripts and versions of the um, Old Testament where David said to his brother is there not a cause if you look for instance maybe in the NIV or in the ESV it will say was it is it not just a word was it you know what have I done haven't I just said a word and King James New King James David said is there not a cause now I entitled today's message because right? Building off of cause. And let me give you a definition of cause, that which provides a ground or a reason, right? That's a cause. And when I'm, whenever I'm teaching the scriptures, I have to always make sure that I'm being, you know, honest, you know, with the scriptures and faithful and not making a sermon out of, you know, a passage where it doesn't apply and things like that. And so as I begin to look at it and think about it, even if David said, was it not a word? This is still applicable because the reason why he fought Goliath, there there was a cause. There was a reason. There was a reason for David to inquire about fighting Goliath. There uh, There was that for which provided a ground, a reason. And I want to talk about the reasons why you and I should fight to be all that God wants us to be, to fight to live the way God wants us to live, to, you know, deny ourselves, you know, if we must, to, you know, sacrifice if it takes that, to press through difficulties if that's what it takes, that there's a reason. And I want to talk about the reasons from the least of the reasons to the greatest reason, okay? And that's what I want to build today. I want to start off talking about the reasons from the least to the greatest. Now, David asked the question, he says, what's going to happen to the man? And they said, well, whoever beats Goliath, 
the king going to bless him, right? King going to give him money. He gonna, his family going to be free. That meant that they weren't going to have to pay no taxes or nothing like that to the king. He said he was, the king was going to give him his daughter to marry. There were going to be benefits right here and right now for, you know, fighting Goliath. And so the least reason that you and I should fight the fight, walk the walk, live the way God wants us to live, to be obedient, is because there's personal benefit. There's a personal blessing attached to it. Now, understand this. We know that God calls us to serve him and to live for him out of a sincere heart, doesn't he? He causes us to serve him with, out of a pure and sincere heart, as we just sang in the song, for his glory. But the reality is that God has attached promises of blessings to our obedience. And God did that. He attached promise, he, he promised blessings if we would be obedient. So what I'm saying to you today is that one of the best things you can do for yourself is to do the will of God. One of the best things you can do for you is to do what God wants you to do. Are you, are you understand what I'm saying? Uh, you want to try to help yourself? You want to try to put yourself in a, in a good position in life? Do what God says do. Read the Bible. Get on your knees and pray. Go to church and ask God to help you to do what he wants you to do. That's the best thing you can do for, for you. Psalm 84, 11 says, No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who do what is right. So if you walk uprightly, that's what they're doing right. If you walk uprightly before God, he said, Any good thing in your life, he will never withhold it. You don't have to go around begging God for, for the good. He said, if you walk upright and something is good for you, he'll give it. He'll pass. You remember what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? He said, the things that you need in life, he said, they will automatically be added unto you. The best thing that you can do for you is to do what God wants you to do. It's the best thing you can do for yourself. That is definitely a, 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 a reason to fight the fight and to deny your, you know, your, your flesh and to, you know, and to resist temptations and to go to church and to pray and to be consistent in, in, in righteous living. That is a reason for it. That's a ground for it. That's a cause. That's a cause. You see, contrary to some popular opinion, right, God wants you to enjoy life. And we were talking, Marie Claver and I were talking the other day, and we were just kind of tripping on sometimes when people act like, you know, I, you know, I love the Lord too, but I like to enjoy life. You know, so as if, you know, those two things are mutually exclusive. They can't go together. If you live for God, you got to give up enjoying life. You know, if you want to enjoy life, then you can't live for God. As if the devil has got the market cornered on, on, on joy. Are you with me? Like, if you want to have joy, boy, you want to enjoy life, you got to go talk to Satan. Because God don't know nothing about that. That is crazy. Yeah. God gave us life. Yeah. There's no way for us to be more satisfied than with God. Yeah. Jesus is looking and talking to people who are living and breathing. And he said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly than that devil can give it. Amen. Are you with me? This is, what, this is what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3. Verses 10 and 11, he says, 10 through 12, I'm sorry. For he who will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. He said, if you really want to love life, sin ain't the way to do it. If you want to enjoy life. As a matter of fact, you got to avoid sin because God is watching everything you do. And if you walk upright, remember, his eyes are on you, his ears are open to you. And the scripture that we looked at earlier, Psalm 84, no good thing will he withhold you, from them who walk uprightly. Are you with me? Amen. Stand here today to tell you that the devil is a liar. He does not have the market cornered on joy. He got the market cornered on, on disgust and defeat and everything that's bad. He said, but if you want to love life and see good days, follow God. The best thing you can do for you is to follow God. Amen? Amen. That's a reason. Another reason, another grounds, another 
ground. So when somebody asks you, why you, why you don't do this no more? Why are you living the way you're living? Just say, because. And you know the reason, right? Because. And, and, and let them ask you, because what? And you begin to tell them. Our God won't withhold any good thing from you. And if I really want to love life and see good days, then I got to walk with him. Amen? Another reason is because the benefits, because of the benefits to our family and our pros- prosperity. And I didn't say prosperity. That's like money. Prosperity is future generations. The benefit to your family and your future generations. You know what? Your future generation needs to have somebody to look back on and say, Grandma, Grandpa, Great Grandma, they live for Jesus. They live for, there needs to be somebody in your family line that people can look back on and say they live for the Lord. And if you didn't have anybody like that in yours, you need to be that somebody for the future. Are you with me? You know, if I didn't have a daddy that I could look at that say, my daddy loved Jesus, I want my children to have a daddy they can look at and say he loved Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I'm telling you that we can't affect the past, but we can't affect the future. See, the three institutions that God established, the, the family, the church, and the government, all those are established by God. When you look in the scripture, remember, uh, the Bible, Romans, Paul says in Romans, there's no authority that which is you know, appointed by God, right? God establishes, of course, he establishes the church. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And he establishes the family. He's the one who created marriage and for, the, uh, for the upbringing of, of children and stabilizing society. And I'm telling you, wherever there's a prosperous, stable society, there's always a foundation of marriage. Yeah. Uh, and, and marriage represents the foundation for family. Yeah. Are you with me? I see people sometimes, uh, you know, get, start dating and somebody got, they got a baby. They say, oh, look, that's a beautiful family. I said, well, what happened when he got children with four women? They all family? Yeah. Are you understand what I'm saying? Marriage is what unites family. Yeah. It makes family, right? Yeah. It's commitment, okay? So anything, listen to me carefully. God establishes a family. And if we do family right, then we can take f- our family goes to the church, and they already got a good foundation. And our family goes to the church, and we build on that, and then, I, and then, I, I, and then we go out into society, and we have an effect in society. And everybody knows that the world is supposed to be better because the church is in the world. Right? You're supposed to be the salt of the, of the earth, the light of the world. But it starts with the family. It starts with the family. So the best thing I can do for my family is to follow God. The best thing you can do for your family is to follow God, to do what God wants you to do. And there's no such thing as following God without having a real relationship with your Bible. Right? Because this is his word. And this is a starting point. To a relationship with God, the word. Faith comes through hearing the word. So parents are commanded, right, to expose their children, expose their children to a life of trust in God. You got to show your children trust in God right? by your example at home and by the example of your friends. In other words, you need to have friends that also are, are, are exhibiting behavior of trust in God. Children need to see it in you. And they're also looking at mom and daddy's close buddies. How they, well, you know, how they doing? Because I know mom and dad, they're telling me to go to church, but they, you know, they, don't, they don't like no church people. Are you with me? Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Or I told you that in the, there's, a, there's a belief that in the, in, the, in the Hebrew, what it says is train a child up in the way he should go, and when he's old, it won't depart from him, that that word won't go bad in him, that it won't, that, that, the, that the training that you put in him, it won't go bad. You know, I go in my closet and find, right, I'm trying to do this as a parent, right? I mean, and, and because I tried to do it, I can have hope till the end of my days that God is going to almost see my children in heaven. Are you with me? I can go in my closet, and I can pull out one of those plastic containers, of uh, those plastic bins that you buy at Walmart, and there's nothing but papers in there, rubber band together from each one of my kids, their writings, because we used to have them to read the Bible and then write about what you read. And I know one thing the Word doesn't do. It doesn't go, it doesn't go bad. It doesn't lose its power. Are you with me? 
Fathers, listen to me carefully. You are supposed to be the priest of your home, the spiritual leaders of your home. We're talking about why the beneficiaries. You're supposed to be the spiritual leaders of your home. It is your obligation, Father, to model godliness to your children. It's cool if you want to shoot them, show them how to shoot the three, how to, how to block, right, how to catch the pass, how to hit the curveball. That's all right. But you got to show them how to live for God. Are you with me? Right? When you stand before God, God don't, don't, ain't going to give two cents about I taught him how to hit a curve. Nobody can. I don't hear that. You need to teach him how to live and be a man for God. It's a man's job. That is a father's job. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Matthew Henry said in his commentary that we should remember that a father should remember that a child is a, uh, they're little pieces of you. He said, and therefore we should deal with them tenderly, with love. Don't be crazy. You know, I, 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 I beat him down. I'm bringing up hard. I want him to be tough. You're going to make him crazy. Yeah. That's what you're going to make him. Yeah. You're going to be confused. Yeah. You think that ain't, that ain't hard and tough. Look at Jesus. They ain't doing that crazy. There ain't nobody hard as Jesus. But nobody tough as Jesus. Jesus took a lick that none of us yeah. could take. Yeah. Bible says he didn't open his yeah. mouth. They spat on him. They put them crowns of thorns, stuck them down in his temple, and blood flowed, right? They beat him with that whip, that uh, cat of nine tails, bl- metal, pulling out flesh, and he's just, right, taking it for us. No foolishness required, right? He was a man's man. You teach your children and show them how to live for God. You show those boys how to live for God. You are showing them how to be men. I got a coffee mug on my desk that says nothing but the truth. It says real men live for God. So we can't be impatient. We can't be unreasonable with our children. Can't be impatient. Can't be unreasonable. But then the flip side of that is that we don't spare the rod. We correct them. I used to tell people all the time, say, you don't whip your child in anger. You whip them out of the spirit of correction. I ain't whipping you because you embarrass me. I'm whipping you because I need to straighten you out. Right? The big difference. I remember I was working at Greenwood Springs Hospital, and you probably heard me say it before, and there was a guy that came, that little boy was so bad. What a little boy was bad. And all of them saying, he need to, need to whip him. That's what they need to do. He need to whip him. And then it came, and his daddy came for the little counseling session, and the daddy was like, I'll whip him. I whip him like crazy. Ooh, if I whip him. And I didn't understand then, but I understand now. The whipping is not, it's the spirit of it. You whip him because he's mad. You whip him because he embarrassed you. You whip him because you're fed up. You need to whip him to want to correct him. The Bible said it's called the rod of correction, not the rod of embarrassment, not the rod of I'm tired of you, not the rod of you shamed me. Are you understand what I'm saying to you? If you want God's power to be in it, then you got to do it out of the spirit that God says do it. <laughs> Father, it's on you to lead. Wife shouldn't be running the children to church. You ought to be. It's your job. Wife shouldn't have to say, you coming to church with me today? She ought to be going like, I got to go, baby. You, you know, you don't miss no church. It's your job. We are created to lead. And I got to, th- you know what? If the world's going to be in a mess, I, I got to first of all say it's because men ain't doing what they're supposed to do. And I got to take responsibility and do my part. Amen? And mothers, you are supposed to be virtuous. Wives, you're supposed to be virtuous women. Women with, you know, of, of excellent moral, you know, uh, standard and character. That's what the woman is supposed to be. Because it's going to benefit the children. It's going to benefit your family. I love what Proverbs 31 says. Proverbs 31, verses 27 and 28 says about this virtuous, this excellent woman, that she watches over the ways of her household. She doesn't eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. You know, you ever heard me reference every now and then, I reference talking about something, how much I love Melissa, and I love her dearly. I don't know if a man could ever love a woman more. I love her. But let me tell you something about Melissa. Melissa handled her business. You hear me? Melissa don't eat the bread of idleness. She seek after the ways of her household. And the, and the words that we use at the house, she a whole woman. You heard me? 
She handles her business. So I, I, got, I got good reason to love her the way I do. Are you with me? I got a call. There's a reason. She handles her business. That's what a woman's supposed to do. Handle your business. Take care of your house. Look to the ways of your household. Let your, make your husband praise you. Make people in the street be like, oh, yeah. And like, look at uh, one of my uh, cousins saw us was years ago. We were at Walmart, and we were talking, and he told, he told me this. He said, I need to find a younger version of you. He said, I need a woman like you are, because you know, I was just singing her praise, you know, like, this is the best wife in the world. No offense, Mark. I know you think you got the best wife in the world. And it's, y'all got the, y'all got the, you know, I understand, you know what I'm saying, but I'm partial. <laughs> and I got the mic. <laughs> Amen? So, uh, you know, you get the mic, you sing your wife praise. I got the mic. <laughs> but he wanted a younger version of her because I was describing her as the perfect woman. Amen? But that's because she handles her business. Right? And it's a benefit. And women, you need to do your job. Children are the benefit. Fathers, do your job. Family is dependent upon it. Tell you, there's so many people out there that's trying to show our children what, what real, real manhood should be. And so many women trying to tell your daughters what real womanhood should be. You got to counteract that at the house. Amen? And then you got to take them to church to a place that helps to reinforce that. Are you with me? And then they can get out there into the school and have a fighting chance. Number three. I said, one, you should, you should, you should fight this fight because it's a personal benefit to you. It's the best thing you can do for yourself. You should fight this fight because it's going to benefit your children and your posterity, your p- future generations. Number three, you should fight this fight because the world is watching. And I'm seeing all of this in, 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 in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm sorry, and I'm seeing all of that because David said, Who's going, what's going to happen, right? You're going to get benefits now. You're going to get a wife. You're gonna, you know, your, your, your family going to be free. They're going to have to pay taxes, right? It's going to benefit your family. And then David told Goliath, he said, oh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to fight you and I'm going to beat you. And the whole earth going to know that there's a God in heaven. You see, the world is watching. Many people form their opinions about Christianity from those who call themselves Christian. Yesterday I was reading and the guy said that he was, he was, he was just, he said, like, you know, I love God. He said, but, uh. Sometimes the people who represent him, they just, uh, what, they, they just, they just discourage me so much. And he was showing, he had some clip from some dude, supposedly. He was a gay pastor who said the Bible was evolving, and you got to let the Bible change with the times. And, you know, there's, there's, I mean, that's the most, that's, that's heresy. That's where that is false doctrine to the core, right? Yeah. If it's one, see, one thing we, that we, we can take comfort in is that the Bible is that fixed point of re- It does not move. It does not change. And you can always look to the Bible to see where you are and where you should be. If it moves around, then we don't know what's what. You understand what I'm saying? We don't know what's what. Let's just say this podium is bolted to the floor. It's, a, it's not, but let's say it was. And so I knew the podium was bolted to the floor. And I know that where the podium is. It's right at the end of the altar. All of the lights are out. It's pitch black, and I'm on the altar, and I can't see my hand in front of me. But if I feel the podium, then I, I have a sense of where I am, right? And I know that it's right at the edge of the altar. And so I know that I, you know, I could turn and go this way, and I'll be safe. But if I walk that way, I'm going to fall off. But what if this thing moves around? And I don't know, you know, I, I, I think it's at the front. That's where it's supposed to be, but it moves now. And I touch the podium, and I say, well, you know what? I could go this way, but I can't go that way, but the podium has moved. And now the podium's back here, and I walk this way. Think It's got to be, you got to have a fixed point of reference to know what's what, to judge things by. How do we judge evil and good based on something that does not change and does not move? And that is what we can take such confidence in God from, is that he is what the Bible calls immutable. He does not change. He is faithful yesterday. He will be faithful today. And he will be faithful a million years in the future. He does not change. You can put your trust in him. That's why Paul says, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. Paul said, he ain't going to change on me. There's no doubt about it, God. So listen to me carefully. 
Many people form their opinions about Christianity based on the lives of those who call themselves Christian. People are watching to see how we handle trouble. Do we cuss when, we, when people make us mad? People are watching, right, to see how we deal with difficulties, how we deal with our differences, how we, whether or not we forgive one another. It's a terrible thing when somebody gets mad and we, I get mad with you at the church and I'm leaving going somewhere else. That is a horrible example. That means we just like everybody else. The man on the job, oh, yeah, I'm mad with you. I'll go find me another job. Church is supposed to be different because we are supposed to be peculiar people, chosen generation, different. God's own. Are you with me? Yeah. And I'm not saying there's never a reason for anybody to leave a church or something like that. There are reasons, but they're small and narrow, and they're all based normally on doctrine of morality of the leaders. Are you with me? Yeah. Not just, I ain't like what you said that day. That's crazy. Make no sense. You know, patted me, you know, I done, I done patted you on the back for two years for your sermon, and then I get one sermon you don't like and you're out of here. Really? Tell me God cool with that. No. We gotta do better. People are watching. People are watching, guys. Let me tell you, I've shared a couple quotes from you, uh, with you before. There's a quote from uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who was no, by no means a Christian, right? <laughs> but he was acquainted with the, with, the, with the writings of Christ, and he said, with the life of Christ, and he says, I like your Christ, I don't like your Christians. He said, because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. He said, when I look in the Bible, he said, I like Christ, man, you know what I'm saying? This, you know, I like that, I like that. He said, but the Christians ain't like him. But I'm saying, like, how can I say I'm Christian if I'm not like Christ, because being Christian means to be Christ-like. And so I'm saying, if you're going to call yourself Christian, you've got to tighten it up. If I'm going to call myself Christian, I've got I to tighten this thing up, man. Frederick Nietzsche said Christians are going to have to look a lot more redeemed than they ever expect me to trust in their redeemer. And now sometimes those things are smoke screens or whatever, but we need to remove all of those smoke screens. We need to strive to be a clear light, clear lights for Christ. Clear lights for Christianity in every area of our lives. And I told you in the past, what we have a tendency to do is that we turn our, our eyes away from our weaknesses and focus on our strengths and say, I got it. I'm doing all right. I'm beautiful. I know they probably got some things. No, no, no. Let's look at those things because that's the things the world is looking at. Are you with me? That's the things that were. You remember I did that little illustration before. Took a white piece of paper, put a black dot on it, and asked everybody, what do you see? Well, they say a black dot. Not all of the white. And so we have to strive to be the best we can be because the world is watching to see what is Christianity really about. And if nothing else, to remove the quote-unquote excuses that people give for not going to church. I ain't going to church. I got too many hypocrites. We need to be people that say that. That won't be because of me. You know, when David sinned with Bathsheba, what Nathan the prophet told David, he said, through God, he said, you have given the enemies of God a great occasion to blaspheme. He said, you know, they want to blaspheme anyway, but you gave them a, uh, you know, you gave them a legitimate reason to do it, right? And that's the thing that you and I have to strive to stay away from. I know that we're not going to be perfect, but man, we got to press hard to try to do this thing right because the world is watching to see how we represent God. So we got to try hard. Gotta try hard. Somebody said they got five gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. And before we, some people will ever look at the first four, they're gonna look at you. So we gotta be try. You gotta try to be a clear light to those who know you. The people who know you, you gotta try to be a clear light to them. Lastly, I said we were gonna move from the least of the reasons to the greatest reason. The least reason that I should. Walk up right is because it's going to bless me. I mean, it's going to bless me. And that's a reason, but that's the least of the reasons. Greater than blessing me is it's going to bless my family. That's a good reason. It's greater than, it's greater than you know, the reason of me being blessed. But it still ain't the greatest reason. A greater reason is the world's watching. Greater than my family being blessed or me being blessed is because the world is watching to see how I represent Christianity. The greatest reason of all is because God's glory is at stake in our lives. Did you ever realize that, that from the moment you say that I'm a Christian, 
I believe in Christ, that God's glory is at stake in your life. That's why David said in Psalm 23, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Because God's glory was at stake in the way that David lived. And I understand that, God. Didn't always understand it, but I understand it now. That God's glory is at stake. That God is going to look good or bad depending on how I live because I say I represent him. Are you with me? Now, if you say you represent the devil, you do all the dirt you want if you got goals with that. But if you say you represent God, that dirt got to stop. God's glory is at stake in our lives. David said, all the earth is going to know that God is a God in Israel. You know, in a very real sense, David's greatest challenge wasn't even Goliath. Before he ever faced Goliath, he had to overcome his own brother's discouragement. He had to overcome King Saul's discouragement. You know, his brother was discouraging him and and, and talking about him and telling him, take, go back home, you little evil, naughty boy. And then Saul was like, you can't fight Goliath. He's been fighting since he was a boy. You ain't nothing but a boy. You can't beat him. He had to, he had to press through those discouragements. But David pressed through those discouragements because there was a cause. That for which gives a reason or grounds. You will have discouragements in your life. You'll have, you know, sometimes disappointments, right? You have Bad bump, 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 run-ins with other other believers in the faith, right? And and we go, you know, I might rub you the wrong way, or you rub each, we rub each other the wrong way, but we gotta press through those things because there is a reason. We gotta press through that because I gotta be patient with you because. Why? Because what? Because God wants me to, and it's going to bless me, right? It's going to bless my family because the world is watching, and ultimately because God's glory is at stake. I got I to gotta be patient because, and, I, and we got to be faithful because, right? And we got to be long-suffering because, and I got to go to church this morning because, and I got to go to Bible study Thursdays because. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Right? And I got to fight my flesh because. And I got to fight my laziness because. And I got to get up and pray because. And I got to read my Bible because. There's a reason, the grounds to do it. Many lesser reasons and none greater than the glory of God is at stake in your life. Amen? Amen. Let me stop right here.